Good news first, the world's in great shape. Dark artistry of capturing war and its immediate consequences has been with us ever since the large-scale blood spilling became a recurring ritual of nations. But regardless of how realistic the colors and brush strokes were, the actual look of war only began to emerge with technology. Stereo photography was the first objective medium to capture death and destruction on a wide scale. More objective than the eye, it was neither adding nor subtracting any of the glory or iniquity out of the spontaneity of the post-combat at mise-en-scene. Blood was fluid, flags were cloth, dirt was dirt. There was little room for interpretation or expression in capturing a field of corpses. Since those times, cameras were there to archive moments of bravery and savagery. From cave paintings to smartphones, we have a history of mankind at war. If combat footage ever looked appealing, it was because of the rawness of the experience it had captured, that radical state of heightened senses. And it's a good thing we have these old archives of death. They show that, despite the glorifying songs and prevalent pro-war sentiments of the day, the war was pure horror even then. New centuries saw the rise of new technology. Tape was slowly being retired as a form of storing visual information. DVD is now almost as iconic as VHS, but it was the new thing at the time. High definition video in all its lossy glory was the new standard for capturing carnage with hallmarks such as background blur and mosquito noise giving it texture and flavor. Digital brought new forms of distortion to the footage of mechanized combat. 2003 was a year where weddings and combat footage had the same look. Wars come and go, but the footage stays, and once all of the participants die or their memories fade, there will never ever be an Iraq war without this filter. Record becomes new and only visual identity. I can show you an illustration of war, I can show you a painting, a photograph or camera footage. The only thing I cannot show you is how it had looked to the naked eye. In this battle between eye and lens, memory and footage, video games also have a place. Modern warfare captures some of this visual identity. Just like camcorders and view cameras take something out of the visual reality of war and add something in, such as those ghastly or angelic white skylines in the background, so did modern warfare's engine and textures. Distant palm trees trees fading in blur, dust particles in the air, red glare in the night, impersonal high contrast monochrome interface of the gunship, corrosive green of the night vision. Game has a narrow color palette dominated by washed out greens and sepia. A gritty look for a gritty experience. The game doesn't have a unique art style and its visual experience is one of realism rather than creativity, which minimizes the chance for uniqueness in the way it looks compared to the strong imaginative expression and interpretation of Dishonored and Bioshock. It is interesting to compare this aesthetic against the universal visual identity of the actual war, to see how good games are at capturing aesthetic through art style. Modern Warfare is a game built on a profound aesthetic legacy. Classic Call of Duty games looked good enough to elevate the benefit of the doubt to the point of an instinct. Set pieces, weapons, uniforms, it was as if an image of war was becoming alive in your hands. Before World War II themed shooters had exploded on the market, players got to shoot at demons, zombies and cultists. There were always exemptions, but somewhere around Hitman contracts and SWAT 4, the industry really started this tonal shift from superficially gruesome to darkly mature, the kind of change that would later give us GTA 4 after San Andreas and Max Payne reboot. Modern Warfare follows not just the graphical improvement of the sequels, but their tonal shift as well. Call of Duty 2 and 3 were slowly building up this identity of grittiness in the portrayal of war, and Modern Warfare had introduced a darker, grittier tone to the series, further adapted by World at War and Black Ops. Here we can see the evolution of not just realism and immersion, but visual identity as well. Unlike Far Cry games, where the aesthetic identity emerges for the most part out of their setting and open world design, in Modern Warfare this identity is built on several elements. Setting does provide a time frame for a significant part of the visual experience, but other elements play their part in its identity. More than setting and its visual references, movement and motion are elements that represent the core aesthetic experience of the game. Another thing that really ends up defining the game is the cinematic presentation of the military and special operations aesthetic. In Far in Far Cry 2 you are left in the jungle to create your own experience through survival. In Modern Warfare everything that happens is presented to you and it's always choreographed with a lot of style. 
Before I go any further, a small notice. I'm going to dissect the game the way I see it and highlight elements I find to be the core of this experience. But at the end of the video I will also briefly summarize my own impressions of each mission. The reason for this is that most missions are fairly unique and the same mechanic can have a different feel depending on the mission specific atmosphere and objectives. Wars have their own aesthetics. They are consequences of countless causes, deliberate and circumstantial, deeply psychological and merely technical. They emerge rather than being created. Look at what Iraq and Afghanistan wars are made of. Warfare in a foreign country with a completely different culture, language and race. Exotic looking camouflage unlike the ones at home. Controversies and multitude of opinions about the conflict in the media. They are almost like Vietnam War too. That war seems to have become the prototype for modern wars being built on the same mechanical skeleton of the original Call of Duty games featuring similar blend of loosely structured gameplay and scripted events of varying cinematic quality all in a new tactical attire, Modern Warfare ended up being a completely different aesthetic experience. It offers us two distinctive sides of the new warfare. Marine part of the story is a full-scale war, with bodies piling up around levels and large-scale operations taking place in urban areas. There's no stealth, no sniping segments, no three-man operations. Instead you get tank support and automatic grenade launcher mounted on a helicopter. Not a single firearm features a suppressor. It's literally an aesthetic remake of the old COD games. That unchanging infantry experience. SAS segments offer a different experience altogether. There is more stealth and room clearing with smaller teams. You are on the run a lot of the time. Mission structure is more dynamic with objectives tailored towards small scale operations. The arsenal at your disposal matches the approach required to execute these objectives. Call of Duty series has already seen special operations during British campaign. I clearly remember feeling positively stunned when seeing for the first time this team of SAS commandos infiltrating Sicily. It felt different from the grunt simulator experience of the rest of the game. Everything about them was unconventional in comparison to the regular army. Special operations, stealth, sabotage, against all odds action, cinematic escape. This mission is a small diorama out of which the whole SAS side of modern warfare has emerged. Transition from SAS to Marines is visually distinctive and feels different both in its looks and gameplay. Mission objectives, pacing, weaponry, everything is tailored to create two different experiences. Both an SAS operative and a Marine have unique looks, signature and recognizable. There is something so unnatural and alien-like in the silhouette of an SAS operative, especially the bug-eyed gas mask, tightly laced boots and black uniform. And the changes in the silhouette of US Marine have been a modernization of the one from previous wars. Once again, there is that intense visual contrast between weapon designs, which are worlds and ideologies apart, despite the shared purpose. Tactical military aesthetic is supported through multiple layers, from uniforms and weapons to animations and movement. At the time of its release, it was a brilliant and refreshing blend of gameplay and narrative, resulting in an aesthetic experience well contained within the targeted amalgamation of military realism and cinematic action. Shooters have evolved in terms of level design and storytelling. Realistic details offer a more nuanced experience with technicalities such as better animations and sounds. But that core loop of aiming, shooting and moving has been the same for decades. Throwing grenades and pulling triggers remains the same. It's hard to change that core physicality of war. Look at the long line of similarities. Holding stock on the M1 carabine would be opened up or closed while drawing the gun. This was becoming more and more prevalent with the sequel. This is a small cosmetic detail that adds to the overall motion of war. There were segments with robust stealth system. There was a level where the origin of tension and excitement was the fact that you were infiltrating a ship disguised as a German soldier. Night and day in the same level. Sabotages, car and plane level, sniping, rescue. Chase scene during the endgame is very reminiscent of that truck ride alongside the Eder River. Even the bird eye credits feel like a bit of an homage to the original Call of Duty side scrolling credits. The credits that I actually wanted to watch. There are so many possible juxtapositions of same sameness and similarity, of graphically updated repetitions. The series have been painting over the same mechanic of war for years. The whole game is essentially an aesthetic update of the core Call of Duty experience. Only in comparison to Modern Warfare did I realize how versatile the original games were. 
Call of Duty series has been pulling off the exercise of aesthetically redressing the same visual elements for years. And this echoes our grim reality. Uniforms change, firearms change, design behind the war changes, but its physicality is the same. That same will contained within a muscle prompted to action has been splitting skulls with a stone axe and throwing grenades. To oversimplify things and use a verbal cliche, I'll say that modern warfare is significant for showing us two things, how wars are different and how they stay the same. Let's break down an important and emotionally dynamic mechanic in two different aesthetics. Fighting a tank or a helicopter as a foot soldier. First, you are made aware of the threat through a scripted sequence or dialogue. You pick up the weapon from a crate or a dead soldier. You are presented with a design that serves a special purpose. Its contours on your screen are unlike any other firearm you've used up to that point. Blending into the rest of the game, the design and visuals reinforce the cumulative aesthetic experience of the whole setting. They serve the same purpose, and you're using the same controls to aim and fire the weapon. But instead of firing immediately, with Javelin you have to focus the aim on the object until you hear a sound signal. The rocket will do the rest after that. The sudden sense of danger, the impersonal domination that metal gives off, and the urge to overcome the underdog status. The whole experience is largely the same on a mechanical level, but that slight visual difference between firing and the final outcome does change the experience and visual feedback. The experience of using these two weapons is different and gives different feedback, despite having the same mechanical foundation behind visuals. Later they did the same thing with different types of grenades and more dominant forms of movement such as wall running and extreme jumps. And all of these are just expansions of the core mechanic in a way that fits the aesthetics of the new lore, but this creativity has limits when it comes to creating experiences. Mechanics, no matter how fun or innovative they are, have to be a significant part of a larger whole. Bullet time is just a cool feature if you strip away the leather jacket, rain-drenched New York and a neo-noir story of revenge. I really like the Wingman Heavy Revolver from Titanfall 2. I like how it looks, how snappy its recoil feels, how Avatar uses that rarely seen cross thumbs grip. The only thing I don't like is that the reload is too fast. All of these design elements make the experience more detailed and nuanced. But mechanically this revolver is the same as Webley from United Offensive. You aim, you shoot, you reload. And while the original game now seems old in terms of textures and animation, its guns still support an experience of war within a certain framework of historical and technical accuracy. It becomes clear how little the core gameplay loop of shooters has changed mechanically, and adding plasma rifles or gravity guns only expands this loop slightly, and I find this to be a good thing. It establishes the language of the first person shooter. The core rule of writing has been the same since the Sumerans and is used to different effects. The same simple system of lining up words with punctuation has captured human experience, ideas and emotions imagination, from the purest realism to the most imaginative fiction, sometimes combining the two. Video games have already established their language, it is now up to creativity to explore its potentials. This loop of navigation, aiming and shooting and the sensation of an immersive flow that it creates is the basic language of the first person shooter, regardless of the time and space. But Javelin and Stinger are just Panzerfausts with a quirk. One thing that has actually changed is the stealth mechanic. In the old games, stealth was just a visual treat that left us wanting more. In first mission you can sneak behind the guard and kill him with the butt of the rifle, but that's where the stealth ends. The game was constantly implying stealth through atmosphere, but it was never substantiated with mechanics. In modern warfare, stealth is a separate mode of warfare. It is a modification of the shooting loop and represents an independent experience experience with its own set of rules and emotional feedback. Genres already have that basic mechanical language established. It is the equivalent of a cave painting, and now the world of possibilities is open. When we do our best to scrape off that thick layer of nostalgia and leave just enough of it to be able to look past the jerky animations and poor graphics, I think players still like Blood Money and Max Payne because of the aesthetic experience they offer. Mechanics and graphics are important, but their integration into an experience is what elevates them above entertainment and pure technicalities. Aesthetics give them momentum to become more. Modern Warfare shows us that simplest gameplay loop of old shooters can still be used to create memorable experiences.
Avatar's movement is the same compared to the original games, that fixed perspective moving forward and turning around. True sense of tactical approach is given through observing the rest of the team. Movement is one of the most significant visual changes that came with the modern setting. It's the new era of combat and a lot has changed in terms of how soldiers approach different situations in war. The mobility of troops and machines is the determining factor carrying the story forward and adding so much visual potency to the game. The sharp contrast with between Normandy landings and the helicopter invasion is the most bizarre testament to that. More than uniforms, more than holographic sights and desert camouflage, movement is what differentiates these two games. In that landing craft you are a sitting duck as it slowly progresses to the shore where literal hell awaits. While I can't think of a sequence more representative of an invasion than that ride in the Black Hawk helicopter, compared to that boat thing it is definitely a dominant position. The game utilizes movement within level design and atmosphere to capitalize on the emotional impact of two different in-game states, open combat and stealth. Often the very atmosphere of the mission heavily relies on the movement itself. Look at these two, they are worlds apart. In Modern Warfare you are genuinely made to feel like a part of an extremely efficient team. You are not the only facilitator of action. But what really sells this experience to me is the way they move. Voice acting is great, personalities are bare but developed enough to be predictable. But the way their intent and dedication are animated marks the whole experience for me. Modern Warfare is a beautiful catalog of moments that stimulate motion in time and space. Their movement is the strongest feedback of this new tactical aesthetic. Bodies in motion, signaling direction, purpose, emotions, strife. They give momentum to the experience and a sense of streamlined motion of always going forward with force. Motion in its barest form is one of the unintentional visual themes of the game. The sensory appeal found in the imitation of the elegance of human movement. The mechanics and core motivation behind them basically haven't changed since Return to Castle Wolfenstein. Whether you are escaping a dungeon inside a Nazi castle or storming the Reichstag, behind the obvious thematic reason, we are on a more basic and far less superficial level prompted to action by momentum of that very same action. The mechanical core behind a first person shooter and its appeal hasn't changed since the 90s. Most of the time it is action for the sake of excitement, action for the sake of action. Classic game Games like Medal of Honor and original Call of Duty have slowed down this run and gun principle with scripting, cinematics, stories and themes. Modern Warfare has sped this experience up once again without losing any of the above. There are missions tailored specifically to showcase these different approaches represented through animation. Motion is basically life and finding satisfaction in causing motion or witnessing it must be something based deep inside our minds. And playing the game, which as an experience is brim with these moments that stimulate motion and its anticipation builds up a distinctive feel. And when you dress this raw motion with new uniforms and weaponry, this tactical aesthetic feels complete and makes the experience consistent. SWAT 4 and Vegas also explore the visual theme of motion, but on the opposite side of the spectrum where slow pace is the core of the experience. These snippets of movement constitute a sense of large scale motion that envelops everything around you. And this is war at its core, grand motion built up on individual movement of all its elements. One of the most refreshing things about Modern Warfare was the overall elegance of presentation. Elements that give structure to the story and establish its pacing are incredibly stylish compared to older games. It has an additional layer of visuals that try to mask the inherently technical side of video games. Presentation of the story and its core conflict is stylish and bold. Offering multiple protagonists to witness different fronts is a part of the series tradition, but the concept has been rearranged to fit a more thrilling and intense cinematic experience. Passage of time and movement through space with multiple characters is the new norm. Signature of the series expanded to fit more modern inclinations. Sliding from the loading screen through the sky into the avatar is a visually interesting introduction to the level. Literal entering into the character through a hole in the fourth wall. These skydive introductions to the mission add a dose of pump and yet still blend the loading screen with the gameplay organically. It's a simple thing but feels far more immersive than sharper cuts between non-playable and playable states. On top 
top of that some guns are racked when brought up for the first time. Motion promising more motion. And there's variation within them. In Blackout and Debug, the perspective slides in from the actual satellite map through the clouds into the in-game world. In Warpig, it almost scrapes against the highway above the Avatar. In the coup, you go straight into the head of Alfulani, so there's no doubt about the perspective you inhibit. The beginning of each mission is like a small diorama establishing the atmosphere of the level. You get the essence of the setting. Disturbed sea disappearing into the impenetrable darkness of the stormy night. Dawn drawn out across the shades of pink. Idyllic countryside. Middle Eastern coast and city streets. So much visual flavor in these opening panoramas. Gameplay is designed in such a way as to reflect a more shifting narrative. Good old minimalism of glorious World War II charges wouldn't be enough to support the story. Short cinematics are incredibly intense and precisely placed so as to not interrupt the pace. And they help break out the traditional FPS gameplay loops of running, aiming and shooting. Modern Warfare is a triumph of balance between design elements. It is incredible how this game manages to be such a great experience considering how little innovation it brings, just by smartly rearranging already existing tropes and concepts. Original games took their time with both the gameplay and the story. One of the most important design philosophies behind Modern Warfare was the achievement of flow in gameplay. The whole campaign is an exercise in stimulating motion through action and its anticipation. You're always on the edge, pushing forward and anticipating more action. In order not to use any cutscenes, the game has created an entire level just so that a piece of the story could be told through Avatar. And sequels have used the same technique with vignette levels such as No Russian and Space Segment. The coup is basically glorified intro credits, serving a simple narrative purpose that could have been delivered to players in a myriad of far less stylish ways. Perhaps it is a gritty homage to the monorail sequence from Half-Life. The boldness and elegance of style is what keeps Modern Warfare timeless. Animations will age even more, textures will blur compared to everything new, and the story was never any high art, but how this whole aesthetic package is presented will retain its freshness. Greatest testament to the ingenuity of its simple design stylishly presented is the fact that the remastered version feels incredibly fresh without making changes to the original campaign. Look at the brilliance of simplicity embodied in that epilogue photograph, a simple thing ending the whole experience on a somber note. Three out of four of the guys on it are dead, and this photograph has a greater effect on those who have just finished the game than many cutscenes out there. This photograph, a piece of memorabilia, is the true ending of Modern Warfare. The game grips your attention and doesn't let go. Just like editing can save a film, so can the tightening of the experience save a video game. I believe the aesthetic identity of this game had emerged somewhere in the development process similar to the cutting room of the film industry. For reference, I had barely managed managed the complete binary domain. It kept throwing the same goddamn shooting loop at me during the whole playthrough and a game where you beg for a cutscene or a scripted event is a poorly designed game. And I straight gave up on Pacific Assault, admitting to myself that I simply cannot keep on shooting through the same jungle just to get to another one. Modern Warfare doesn't suffer from this, far from it. It tries to mind every second of the experience. What this game essentially does is present old war mechanics within new war aesthetics. Vintage cards were presenting the war. Modern Warfare exploits it with style. The setting for the whole sub-series is basically the world, one giant stage for the theatrics of war. Modern Shooter is strongly defined by the set pieces ripped out of its general setting. Setting in older games felt like a postcard from a previous life. Sushi bars, casinos, banks. They replaced the small towns of Holland and the rubbles of Stalingrad. Wine cellars of France are replaced by offices and restaurants. Its set pieces are like moments preserved inside a bottle. Charming Russian villages embodying the visual identity of orthodoxy, picturesque streets of the Middle East, bleached out horizons of Pripyat, shining metal of an international cargo ship in the darkness of the stormy night. Middle East and small town Russia are captured in their stereotypical uniqueness. Choice of the setting is such that the game always ends up contrasting traditional architecture with modern technology, military helicopters cutting up the horizon, soldiers' silhouettes juxtaposed against nature, artificial never blends in with the traditional or natural, it always cuts against the background, visually unwelcome as well as in flesh. Aesthetically, the game is in the middle of the franchise, between meadows of Normandy and space colonies. Conflict from Modern Warfare strives to replicate the scope of the World War II, trying to make you feel like part of something big and significant. You will ultimately end up fighting for the future of the world. Later in the series, we even get to see a mission mimicking the D-Day. It is an amalgamation of Cold War fears with visuals of the real-life conflicts at the time. There are three distinct real-life aesthetics imitated in this 
this game. Alternate Cold War atmosphere, real life Iraq war and golden age of the SAS when their operatives were TV rock stars. It's all there, radicals taking over a Middle Eastern country, prominent Russian bad guy, foreign intervention. This is a melting pot of films and new reports, a visual extract of a distilled decade. But they only help establish the mise-en-scene. It's like a war documentary that doesn't document anything besides architecture and weaponry. What's bizarre in this partial imitation of reality is that certain visuals bear strong symbolisms regardless of context. The fact that a shack in the village of Azerbaijan becomes a courthouse for al-Assad with an SAS captain as his judge, jury and executioner is probably without intended message. But the symbolism of this imagery is very impactful and could be perceived by many as more than just Price's badassery. But modern warfare often dodges reality with its choreographed war and manages to downplay and reduce the images to mere action. It masters the cosmetics of war. Another significant change in the aesthetic experience were weapons and their configurations. Attachments further alter the already changing silhouette of a gun. The simplicity of streamlined design of wood and metal blending into a killing machine is long gone. Mounting a bayonet or the rifle grenade launcher feels like a high point of technology in World at War, not to mention the flamethrower. In modern warfare gadgets and modifications change the factory look of the gun to a point where it gets a completely new outline. Gone are the days when bayonet and sling were the only additions. It shows us the aesthetic progression of war through more sophisticated tactics and technologically advanced weapons and gadgets. Using these gadgets, despite them being mechanically the same to the old games, creates a far more tactical feel during gameplay. New weapon systems further streamline the shooting loop with simplified sights, larger magazines and faster reloads. Pacing and dynamics of the loop are changed. There is less movement around the gun, no individual beats of bolt action reloads. Firefights have a new rhythm. With quick reloads and intuitively snappy sights, these weapons are designed to stimulate the overall motion of war as one of its smaller elements on an instinctive level. I often tend to dismiss shooters as mindless entertainment, and most of them are. This is because they lack a mature story or team, while not even offering a dynamic shooting loop. The fact is that their very design isn't the most suitable for serious examination of mature teams, but having a dynamic and satisfying shooting loop that fits in with the rest of the game and creates an experience that immerses your reflexes into the loop should be enough. I don't play it because of the story or themes, but because it turns my input into a small cog in one giant well-oiled roaring machine of war. I love the old Call of Duty animations, even when they are inaccurate and a bit uninspired, but Modern Warfare had really constructed an aesthetic experience of immersion in military realism through animation. There's more heaviness simulated in the way Avatar performs pretty much every action. It had much more tactically nuanced reload animations than SWAT 4 or Vegas. The whole series aren't particularly animation heavy nor expressive when it comes to the Avatar, but Modern Warfare creates a feel of military pragmatism through reloads. They don't reveal anything about the character except that he's extremely proficient with his gun. Reloads are fast and precise, breaking the pace of the firefight for a second or two before you're back in action. And most new guns have far better ergonomics, which is reflected through single hand reload animations, where Avatar doesn't have to change hands or reach over the gun to rack the slide. Handguns have a nice additional push from the wrist while dropping the magazine, which fits the idea of not caring too much for the damn thing in the heat of the battle and just wanting it out of the way as quick as possible. I love the Uzi animation. He really makes sure that the bullet gets to the chamber. And look how elegantly he discards the magazine before reaching for a new one. It's pleasing to watch. Notice how, compared to the old games, the act of discarding the magazine is actually animated for a lot of weapons, instead of that out and in animation where a magazine leaves the frame for a second and is quickly fed in with what most of the time feels like a reversed animation. This is a nice touch that adds a visual layer to the gameplay. Another nice detail is how the right hand assists bringing Dragunov into the frame from the shoulder. Avatar takes time to reload it, holding the guard firmly in his left hand while the right changes the magazine and rocks the slide. Reloading the grenade launcher on the AK has the avatar perform a slight jerk of the whole rifle to get the shell out. 
G36 has a really smooth reload. As soon as the magazine is dropped out, the new one is let in. It happens simultaneously and shows harmony of movement that is a result of countless drills. Magazine on the P90 gets a nice little tug just to make sure it's comfy. But the way that cocking handle is operated is a real poetry of movement. I especially like the way his clenched fist opens to let the lever lock in, as if saying, go, be on your way in spreading debt. A sleight of hand with great potential for destruction. AR platforms show their ergonomic superiority, juxtaposing a single press of a thumb against that change of hands on the AK. Shotgun reloads are vanilla, since developers still haven't discovered that bullet to the chamber first trick. Overall, it's a satisfying catalog of dexterity. Call of Duty already knew how to create memorable characters with very little. It is with a great deal of nostalgia that I remember Sergeant Moody, Captain Folly and the original Captain Price. Each of them had a distinctive feature that made them stand out amongst the rest of the soldiers. A unique face, voice and a glimpse of personality. Even Macmillan, whose gillied up face you never get to see, is an iconic character 30 seconds into the mission just by the virtue of his movement, accent and mannerisms. Price wears a boonie hat in the field and has distinctive mutton chops mustache, large sharp nose and a deep, relaxed, self-assured, commanding voice. His whole persona gives off vibes of old British aristocracy. Gaz wears a baseball cap, sports a stubble and dry humor. Macmillan is a walking bush with a Scottish accent. Griggs doesn't wear his army shirt under the west and has a really laid-back personality. Vasquez is a bulky guy with a stakeout version of Winchester on his back. He also has 38 hash marks on his helmet, implying he's taking account of God knows what. Zakaev has a distinctive face, with the noticeable contrast of a shaved head and a long goatee that give him that look of the wise old man from the mountain. He wears a leather coat with adjusted sleeve for his missing arm. His son Victor wears a blue tracksuit and a face whose evil asymmetry you cannot forget fanaticism of the young. Al-Assad has a red beret, a goatee and yellow framed aviators, prototype of a modern day tyrant, ready to make the sacrifice of having his beard trimmed regularly to keep it in shape, he's only missing a Rolex on his wrist. Characters are given a prominent and personalized expression. Voice acting largely helps establish their personalities and language is a big part of the game's aesthetic. The expression is modernized with dark humor and darker euphemisms. We get gems such as these. Civil war in Russia with 15,000 nukes at stake is just another day at the office. And these are the good news. Bad news are the fact that player character is joining the team fresh out of selection and his nickname is Soap. When Gaz asks what rules of engagement are on the cargo ship, Price simply replies, crew expendable, a sophisticated way of saying kill them all. Free nuclear material in the wasteland of Chernobyl is Christmas for the bad guys. Government warranted assassination is shrugged off as doing some wet work, implying that the act will include the spilling of blood. First time they meet Kamarov, he begins running towards the front line with his soldiers after a briefing, but Price grabs him by the shoulder and says, not so fast, remember Beirut. The sentence is so packed with implications that it could probably be a mission in itself. The half-smoked Cuban cigar is established as a status symbol and later becomes a prop with which everything begins and ends in the whole Modern Warfare subseries. Second World War was a brutal event that reduced a lot of people to their tooth and nail, but it is perhaps the last war to preserve the romanticized notion of heroes and villains. Out of this romanticized perception emerges the split between good and bad guys in modern warfare. This is how we got those heartbreakers and life takers. This notion survives the aesthetic transformation. It portrays a modern conflict but preserves the image from the Second World War, where sacrifice isn't futile, where enemies are scum, where violence brings a better tomorrow. It's impossible to have such a universal position on any of the contemporary wars. They've skipped the absurdity of the Vietnam War altogether and once it was actually adopted into the Call of Duty formula, characters had gone through a drastic change. Overall, this story is about heroes, not soldiers, and some of the grittiness of war is lost in the sensationalism of heroism. But even though there's good and bad guys, there's no absolute morality. It is merely a matter of shading. Game constantly pushes you a bit towards the edge, never making a statement, never pointing a finger. Game presents these without much implication and you are free to draw your own conclusions. The game has a lot of dramatic moments subverting the structure of good versus bad guys that it has established. This is not Batman. They still kill people without blinking an eye. In the end, it feels like Price and Soap are just a necessary kind of evil. Good guys that torture and kill mercilessly. They've preserved the romantic image of the hero but have deliberately bastard 
bastardized it a bit, gave it an edge. Plenty of room is left for interpretation, but the game is designed to be experienced, not interpreted. Together with Lara Croft and BJ, Price had one of the best character reboots in the whole industry. Just look at the change he went through, from Hold Your Fire in Call of Duty 2, where he restrains his men at the sight of surrendering Nazis, to a cold-blooded execution of an unarmed man tied to a chair. This highlights the integral cynicism of modern conflicts and their public image, compared to the clean-cut morality of the Second World War. One very significant addition to the Call of Duty formula was the introduction of prominent antagonists. Ideologies, no matter how shallowly horrific they may be, now have a personification. The pinnacle of the one-dimensional hate, revenge or pure evil. A head waiting to fly off the shoulders of the beast. This is one of the clues that the series was beginning to evolve into a more commercial product. It made the drama around the conflict a whole lot more personal. One example is the principal necessity of cinematic executions of these arch enemies. You can't just let them die without making a big fuss about it. But Modern Warfare still possessed a lot of restraint in these blockbuster conventions compared to the sequels. Note how both Battlefield 3 and 4 had featured a prominent antagonist, as well as Warfighter, but World at War didn't. It is a very crude approach to the motivation of antagonists compared to the factions in Far Cry 2 or New Vegas. Take note that this cult of evil is brought up with a lot of artistic freedom. Russian nationalists, let alone the ultra parts of that social strata, do not view the Soviet history history in favorable light. State atheism, international sentiment and modernism have little to do with classical Russian patriotism and traditionalism. How is it that such a paradoxical faction exists is not clearly defined within this alternate timeline, and seems to be a bit cartoonish altogether. I guess they felt that going with the straightforward anti-western sentiment would have been too close to the reality they were trying not to depict or comment on, and they had to add just a pinch of communism to the mix, to stir up familiar fears. Ultranationalists and terrorists are a visual replacement for Nazis. Their symbols and motivations are shaped in the shadow of the dark legacy of Nazism, only their uniforms had changed. It has been repeated to the point of a cliché that all war movies are anti-war, through the very act of realistic depiction if nothing else. The same could be said of many games. Modern raindrops on the screen, dying animations, corpses with their eyes wide open towards the sky, dismembered limbs, normalization of brutality, rationalization of violence, triumph of absurdity. A sound human mind would not desire to leave its bones on a meadow somewhere, and just witnessing the horrors of war should be enough to weed out any war-mongering ideology. If the legacy of the Vietnam War could be reduced to a single sentence, it would be that war is hell. That's the motto of its absurd carnage, its conclusion. Modern Warfare is beyond this discussion altogether. It shows companionship that only great risk, when shared, can bring among people. It features technology that's fun and exciting to use, and its depiction of war is stylized to the point of pure form. It is fiction for the sake of action. It doesn't reflect on anything from our reality and uses the Iraq war as a visual reference, capturing the experience of warfare in the Middle East in terms of technology, weather and architecture. It's an act of aesthetic mimicry. It's not anti-war since it doesn't really have a stance on anything. It's an action game before anything else. Story of modern warfare is praised to this day, but I would argue that it's not the story that holds the most appeal, but it's dynamic presentation. Fourth wall breaking dead quotes are there once again, and they represent a wide range of political spectrum, from absolute dismissal of violence to absolute distrust towards humanity. They also show how various ideologies bend already fragile truth to their own perspectives and needs. You'll read everything from glorification of war to strong cynicism towards it. This doesn't feel like taking a stand with regards to anything, more like cataloging the spectrum of intellectualizations of war as a phenomenon. I don't think that featuring a fictional conflict is necessarily an escape from responsibility, but the censorship of Iraq under the guise of the unnamed Middle Eastern country is somewhat confusing considering that Russia, Ukraine and Azerbaijan are featured as real states. I can understand that they didn't want to make any comments on the present and opted out to use only textures of real countries, but uniqueness of their looks prevents this segregation from reality and leaves the whole thing in a sort of limbo. It's a lot easier to dramatize conflicts from the past, especially World War II, the last war that was led while objective morality still existed. It would take a lot of courage to explore a more contemporary conflict such as war in Iraq and all of its social and political nuances. The game is about action, story is just the excuse for it. 
ultra-nationalists replace the Nazis just so that an AK can replace the Sturmgewehr. And the game never shows a pretense for its narrative and themes to have any philosophical quality. Overall, the game is a triumph of form over content, style over substance. What happens is less important than how it happens. Being a straightforward shooter under all the dynamic and stylish visuals, it's hard to say with any degree of certainty to which extent it explores certain themes or if they are merely eye candy. Two that come to mind would be the notion of a thin red line between warm beds and blood hungry bad guys. The other would be the theme of impersonal professional killing. Killing is just a job here, opposed to the heroism of World War II. I really appreciate how the original Modern Warfare had changed the flow of the first person shooter. It wasn't groundbreaking compared to the seamlessness of the original Half-Life, nor did it have intellectual depths of Bioshock's world building, but it was far more dynamic in its pacing. It managed to strike a balance between the fast-paced arcadey origins of the first person shooter and slow-burning campaigns of classical ones. In older games, the narrative is supported by world building, cutscenes or sequences that replace them. Otherwise you have to find notes, initiate dialogues with NPCs, etc. Add loading screens, free roaming, accidental initiations of a dialogue that result in repeated lines and this whole experience gets a bit loose. There's a lot of empty space that serves no purpose whatsoever and slows the experience down with unnecessary freedom as a simple byproduct of the design. So many games fell into that archaic design of cutscene, exposition, shooting, debrief, another cutscene. It is a vicious loop of taking away control and breaking immersion by the very design, and this formula was getting stale. Modern Warfare had tightened a lot of screws around the story, focusing on the excitement in its delivery. Presentation of the story is far superior to the story itself. Almost every element and mechanic that made Modern Warfare such a memorable experience was already featured in other franchises. Night vision, rudimentary stealth, sniping, tactical gameplay, various gadgets. Modern Warfare had managed to combine and integrate them into the experience in a way that felt organic and fresh. Pacing, balance, novelty and style, they give new life to these mechanics. Efficient and purposeful use of every design element towards building up tension around a pretty much standard story, that's where Modern Warfare shines. Loading screen serves the purpose of setting up a scene, advancing the story forward, while Price and Gaz summarize geopolitics with one-liners. These sequences are presented with a lot of style and are an echo of the paper maps of beaches of Normandy. Satellite footage jumping around the world shows showing blueprints and character profiles, invading privacy in an impersonal way. It supports a tactical, briefing room feel, showing new technologies with new technologies. It's not just that they are not static anymore, they are actually part of the game, much more so than the documentary footage or diaries, and are much more dynamic and engaging. Modern Warfare and all of its new technologies had changed mechanics very little. The largest gameplay change lies in the way the campaign was structured. Instead of the simple triptych of the US, British and Soviet perspective, perspective of the war, usually driven towards an epic and triumphant climax, in modern warfare there are multiple protagonists with varying degrees of character or purpose, all participating in the same story, six avatars in total providing perspective on a single line of events. It uses avatars in whole levels for the purpose of developing plot with style, and its levels are designed in such a way that let you experience new gadgets and mechanics in just the right amount, with enough oscillations in action sequences to keep the experience fresh. Every level has a heartbeat of its own, with segments that change the gameplay enough to feel refreshing. The whole campaign takes place across six days and jumping through avatars as well as time zones and space adds momentum and tension to the story. It is a very focused and streamlined experience. Old games had levels with very pronounced beats in their rhythm, compared to the more fluid oscillations of Modern Warfare. Medal of Honor Airborne has a very archaic design and awful pacing. Hell's Highway gives you three minutes of an atmospheric training, then takes about 15 minutes of exposition and briefing through cutscenes, just to introduce you to a short walking sequence and then another cutscene before you actually start to play. By that time, Modern Warfare is already done with the prologue. Everything that would slow the gameplay down, everything that would create too big of a cut in between action is left out. No traditional cutscenes, no planning stages, no cover system, no giving out orders. Despite all the new elements and modern presentation, this game essentially wants you to do one thing, move forward. 
first-person shooters are essentially a simple loop of moving and shooting, with both elements having their complexity expanded with cover, running, sliding or aiming down sights and controlling the number of bullets fired. These loops are then placed in various environments with pacing dictated by enemy AI, level design and firearm mechanics, all materialized through a set of hands holding a gun, from the bottom of the ocean to the clouds. These loops hold the same appeal, the thrill of movement, the excitement of energy being discharged and the satisfaction of accuracy, the immediacy of response to your action. Throughout the decades the feedback of this energy has become more concrete, but the principle has stayed the same. Modern Warfare is designed with the awareness of how both appealing this loop is and how boring it can become with repetition. Linear games are a much more controlled environment and developers have more control over player experience, but less time and opportunities to make an impact. There are no random encounters off the sidetrack, spontaneity has to be simulated. Modern Warfare puts gameplay above all else. No traditional cutscenes, loading screens are dynamic, mission intros are summarized in a few sentences, everything is focused on building momentum. Modern Warfare introduced narratives that are full of subversive moments. Alfulani as an avatar is bound, pushed into the back of a car, kicked and shot in the face. This undermines a long-standing tradition of avatar's immortality. It had challenged what a video game can do in terms of narrative. Not counting Alfulani, the game actually kills off a playable character in the middle of the campaign. While giving a new outfit to the old hero, they made his life a bit cheaper. This is a first-person shooter where in the middle of all the killing you are victimized through a first-person death. Nobody offered us such intimate, non-reversible deaths before and it had quite an emotional impact. Before this, the worst thing that could have happened mid-game was a death of a dear NPC. Protagonists were sacred and safe, at least until the very end. You experience this helpless control of the avatar a couple of times in each installment. It is a bizarre state to be in considering the history of the genre. In Battlefield 3 one of your avatars gets his throat slashed in first person. I wonder where that came from. Or that mushroom cloud scene when the nuke goes off. The original Darkness released a couple of months earlier had a first person torture sequence that you had to go through while in Avatar. But Modern Warfare ended up making it a staple of the series. All of this feels like a modernized and edgier version of that subversive level from the first game where you get to run around with a target on your back not firing a single shot. A shooter where you don't get to shoot evolved into a shooter where you get to die. Dying characters are killed off viciously, no last words, no theatrics or deathbed confessions. They are just extinguished before you. The impersonal brutality with which these guys whose company you've enjoyed during the course of the campaign are executed is stunning. This subverts a very old expectation of theatrical dignity in death. If somebody important is about to die, authors usually make a big scene out of it, as it was the case with Soap's death. They had to introduce real danger in order to create tension, since the new setting lacked the impact of recognizable historic significance, the likes of entering Berlin as a soldier of the Red Army. In Far Cry 2, the powered states were represented through animations and mechanics. In Modern Warfare, besides the classical red screen while being shot at, cinematics for the most part communicate that information to player. And in general, Modern Warfare as an experience is more cinematic than interactive. The game also subverts the power of its antagonists, and the way they die shows how easily disturbed this hierarchy of power is in modern war games. Compared to the prolonged quick time event sequences in later games, 3 out of 4 of the riders of the nuclear apocalypse are dealt with nonchalantly without much theatrics. At the end, most of the team is dead. Last look at Price doesn't give off any signs of life. The whole incident is covered up. By the beginning of Modern Warfare 2, the world is actually in a worse state. This Pyrrhic victory felt gut-wrenchingly refreshing, and the ending was far from flying a flag over the Reichstag. The original Modern Warfare remains a grounded and immersive experience compared to the blockbuster aspirations of its sequels. It was the Game of Thrones of the video game industry. By the time Makarov's corpse hangs from the ceiling, nine playable characters will be killed, seven while in Avatar. Two recognizable national symbols will be desecrated, a war started and brought to its end with one horrifying death count. This challenges what can be shown in a mainstream video game, and more than that, what can be experienced through interactivity. And all of this started with the original Modern Warfare. Regardless of the fact that the story is rarely present in the gameplay loop, scripting adds layers to the level that give authenticity to the experience, out of which smaller stories emerge. Modern Warfare never lets its combat dissolve into monotony of shooting. The heartbeat of the game pumps up and down in its fluorescent green, from one dead and discarded avatar to another stealth sequence. These vignettes of action add an additional layer to the shooting galleries and corridors, breaking the loop for the sake of realism or cinematic 
automatic drill. Kemerov is interrogated by gas on Price's Q while the combat below rages on. Drunk Russian soldier interrupts you for a second. The guy actually raises the bottle towards you for a toast. You sneak past the convoy of tanks and infantry and witness some body disposal methods. You see firsthand how a part and complex of Pripyat has become a kingdom of wild dogs. You get a chance to save a grandpa from bloodthirsty paramilitary scum. From an overpass you see a sky decorated with rockets fired from a truck. This is the staple of the series. Smart-ass comments, short conversations, instances of brief action, all adding layers to either the level, gameplay, characters or the overall story. One of my dearest examples comes from the original Call of Duty, where after ditching your vehicle, Moody asks Elder if he ever stole a car, to which Elder replies, only when I need one, Sarge, implying he perhaps hasn't been the most upstanding citizen before the war and has a skill set besides the one acquired during army training. Modern Warfare is an experience that heavily relies on these scripted moments to deliver tension and thrill. Within their respective aesthetic framework they help support the gameplay experience. There's always so much happening in the background that draws your attention and this movement of bodies and machines adds not just visual density to the frame but make the world around you feel slightly more alive and independent of your action and influence, as if you were a part of a real war. In New Vegas there was a great and important war happening in the Mojave Desert, but you only get to experience it behind the curtains and through dialogue. There was never a sense of scale and the illusion was fragile. In modern warfare you get to be fully immersed into the war as it happens around you. Imagine if Lieutenant Walker didn't fly out of the spinning helicopter. The scene would still work, the emotional impact would still be there, but this animation shows you the intensity of the physical reality your avatar is in. It shows you a consequence, and in-game worlds feel more real if they have consequences. In one brief instance, modern warfare offers us a microscopic view of the fabric of war. Soldier trying to push the container forward simply drops his M4 but as he starts to push he realizes that it's in the way and so he moves it across his back all the way to the left side. I love the unnecessary details because they often end up improving the experience. Call of Duty series have always strived to make every mission pop out with a unique set piece and thrilling action, to implement a design philosophy of constant novelty. All Call of Duty games are carefully tailored experiences with little player freedom. Freedom is sacrificed at the altar of carefully scripted sequences striving to be intense and impactful. And as it seems, they will never get rid of this cinematic influence of action films. It is the essence of its DNA. Linearity of Call of Duty when it's at its worse merely balances out the freedom of Far Cry at its own. Missions are where all the elements come to life in order to represent an experience of highly stylized war. Cinematics and highly linear action featuring memorable moments repeat in beats. You never get to abuse the javelin or air support. Everything happens just enough times to feel fresh and make you want to experience it again. There's only two short segments where you get to use the night vision for example. And these rhythmic beats work within linearity. Intensity of the gameplay varies through each level. Neither the buildup of tension nor its release are a constant. Missions give momentum to the story, each one featuring something memorable, either it being a cinematic moment, an action sequence or level design itself. There is always something that tends to concentrate your attention in one spot. It's where the game comes alive and we get to experience each separate element as a part of the broader vision. The blend of mechanics and set pieces fleshes out the contribution of each mission to the higher concept of the aesthetic experience. Another thing that it does well across all missions is the tone. Each mission brings a particular feel through distinctive setting, atmosphere, objectives and defining color palettes. Mechanic beats of the the game are followed by a modern Michael Mann influenced soundtrack and glorified orchestral pieces. Music moves from foreground to background depending on the cinematic intensity. I find a split between heavy distorted guitar riffs and orchestral music to be symbolic of the identity of the subseries, accepting both modern visuals and old notions of glory in battle. The tutorial is split into two segments. One is the oldest way to teach something, press E to slash this melon. The other is a dynamic course made to test your reflexes. An organic way to integrate the tutorial about ancient FPS technicalities such as shoot, melee or draw your sidearm into an immersive experience. This is what I mean when I say that Modern Warfare has utilized every element towards building up momentum through gameplay. This simple and short course is the triumph of purest video game design. It's the evolved form 
of the attempts to teach players mechanics in a more organic way, blending training with the rest of the game, building upon what was done in Deus Ex, Half-Life and Soldier of Fortune. You test your skills on a well-known mechanical loop of running and shooting but with a new pace and in an environment developed enough to feel like a micro level itself. All COD games had integrated the tutorial into the game's lore as well, but they still had the pacing of a training sequence. In Modern Warfare, training gives you a glimpse of true action. Juxtaposing it to the old ways shows all the hallmarks of the design that Modern Warfare had established. Everything that doesn't stimulate action or anticipation of action is scrapped. Level design is streamlined into an experience of rush and tension. No spontaneous wandering, no prolonged idleness for exposition, no small-scale repetition of a failed segment, no time to turn around for God's sake. And this intense snippet of contained action is merely a promise of what's to come. The opening of the mission throws the new aesthetic in your face. Time and place are established at the start and out of this blend of shining metal and dark water emerges a unique setting with thick atmosphere. Compare this to the introductory sequence for the British campaign in the first two games and the aesthetic redressing becomes obvious. The motion of the helicopter, lightning revealing the freighter in the darkness, the set piece closing in in your field of view, preparations inside the helicopter, everything moves towards that moment Avatar's feet touch the surface of the deck and the action begins. You are not given a chance to brace yourself. The flow of movement is streamlined into that point when the action starts. But this is just a bare motion in its physicality. Look at other layers. Everything in front of you gives off a very strong tactical feel, from gear and outfits to the mode of transportation. The finesse of scripting incorporated into the sequence is what elevates the game to a whole other level for me. Price casually leans out to determine how many puffs he has left. This action reveals so much of his personality and experience without a single line of dialogue. To him, this is just a job. Smoke is drawn in once more, cigar is bestowed to the sea, gas masks are pulled down and made sure to be in place. Every snippet of action promises more action. Compare this to a sequence without these details and it feels plastic and lifeless. That big sharp nose and thick mutton chops in the red glow of a Cuban cigar are what draws all your attention. That cigar is such an important element. Shades of blue and black merge together and define the whole scene and in the middle of this darkness there's that circle of light on his face. Halo of a badass. I hope they do this to Sergeant Moody sometime in the future. Picture the scene. Faden reveals his face. Sleeves rolled up to elbows. Dummy gun resting on his hip as he scans the fields of France on a beautiful sunny day with a vintage looking church tower on the horizon while scolding Private Elder for doing something wrong. Crew Expendable is where those heartbeats of the game emerge out of the design into the gameplay. After fast roping to the deck, this build-up culminates in a room full of soldiers with surprise animated on their faces and in their limbs. You catch them in the middle of their mundane actions. Dying couldn't have been further from their minds. Glass in front of you shatters to pieces as you mow them down. They didn't animate just their surprise, they've actually captured the fact that these guys weren't expecting your late night visit. Momentum is slowed down with two short scripted encounters that are there for the sake of realism. A drunk soldier in the hallway and two soldiers sleeping. This introduces the fact that not every enemy has to pose a threat and implies they have life outside of your mission. The fact that you impose your violence on them while they are sleeping and not on the battlefield further highlights the covert nature of your operation. This might seem like a cosmetic detail, but it's not. Good world building desires an emotional response. You know how when you stumble upon a pagan shrine in the forests of oblivion, the sense of exploration and adventure culminates into this magical feeling, but when you are sneaking inside a house with the owner sleeping in the bed, a whole other set of emotion overcomes you. It is an experience of tension and heightened senses. If the house was empty, you'd behave in a different way. If enemies are shooting at you, then they see you and want to destroy you. If they chat idly, they aren't aware of your presence or don't see through your disguise. If they sleep, then that shows the true extent of your trespassing. Look at how character is added to something as mundane as opening a door. Gaz brings out his shotgun in preparation for tight spaces and shares his tactical philosophy with one of the teammates. This is literally workplace humor. Somebody paid attention to these little heartbeats of the mission that add layers and flavor to linearity. The whole prologue is basically an aesthetic introduction to the game and Crew Expendable shows us the tactical side of this new identity in all its glory. Silhouettes of SAS operatives in their iconic black kit attire are taken straight from the balconies of the Iranian embassy in London. 
Apart from graphical improvements, the most noticeable change are the animations. These characters move in a way that implies their background. Their movement is precise and leaves an impression of professionalism. They don't just run towards death as they did in the vintage Call of Duty games. It becomes obvious that to these guys this is not the first time that they are dancing the dance of death. Crew Expendable remains one of the most memorable openings. Tension of stealth, thrill of action, rush of escape. There is nothing to cut out or add to this mission. These ordinary elements are combined in such a way that constitutes an incredibly unique experience that follows through on the promise of that training course. You see satellite footage tracking a car through the streets with an ominous soundtrack in the background. Tone is set immediately. Two voices observe the situation and you begin to realize that this professional voyeurism is going to be the part of the experience. You are transported from the screen into the perspective of President Al-Fulani in the exact moment he gets blinded by the sunlight as they drag him out of whatever hole he was in. As the blinding light fades, it reveals armed guards and white rows of canine teeth. You see the extent of brief societal breakdown after a military coup from the back of a car. Out of all possible situations, they chose to put you into the perspective of a president living the last moments of his life after he's been overthrown. His lowest point is the game's beginning. We don't know anything about him. He could have been the most righteous official ever, or that guy sitting on a golden toilet while hungry citizen beg outside the palace. He is dragged across concrete and executed on national television. What a viciously dramatic arc for this character. Everything you see outside the car is framed and isolated by cards, windshield, sunroof and windows. Your field of view is at the mercy of design balance between the metal frame and glass openings. And this claustrophobic and obscured perspective marks the whole experience. This is why Modern Warfare is a triumph of pacing and style to a degree unmatched by any other game in the series. It prominently features a whole level for the sake of story and effect. Comparing this to the introduction of Modern Warfare 2 only highlights this superiority. They could have had you infiltrate the streets of Russia undercover while the statue of Zakhaev was being revealed. It would have had a much stronger effect. After the coup, simple images and exposition feel so uninspired. The whole ride is substantiated with so much detail that you don't even notice the minimalistic interactivity. Burning cars blocking the streets, soldiers firing their AKs in celebration of victory, passing tanks and helicopters maneuvering in the background, civilians running through the streets, arrests, executions, home break-ins, invasion of privacy, that staple of every dictatorship. Victor has a phone call and in the middle of the conversation he takes the phone away from his ear and turns to look at you. You know the conversation is about you but the look on his face is not promising. Another detail that I really like is how the driver's movement is animated. For the most part he steers with just one hand while the other is resting on his thigh. But occasionally while making a sharper turn he uses both hands. One of the most menacing things is how casually Victor looks at the carnage around you. All the while that ominous bullet swings on the rear view mirror. So much capacity for destruction encapsulated inside a brass shell, a universal symbol as recognizable as the cross. But one detail that I find to be the most satisfying is the sight of the waves breaking against the shore. The sea doesn't care about the sad finale of Al-Fulani's life. Laws of physics bend to no man's tragedy. The world is not going to stop manifesting its idle and indifferent beauty just because a life is about to end. Those wild waves breaking against the shore right outside the window is the closest Al-Fulani will ever again be to that raw freedom. Zakhaev is presented with very little context and this creates an aura of mystery around him. No explanation is offered for his missing arm or a different uniform. The way he hands over the gun to Al-Assad implies on an instinctive level that he's the one pulling the strings. He stands there outside camera view and observes silently as if he's the devil himself. History of assassinations proves that you don't need a mean looking gun to kill a president. But few handguns have as prominent an outline as Desert Eagle and almost all are big revolvers. In this scene, Desert Eagle is definitely an object possessing great visual power and it focuses all your attention to that giant muzzle. It's easy to miss, but Al-Assad's lower face stretches into a smug Cheshire cat smile split second before the muzzle flash engulfs the whole screen. Perhaps they weren't aware of the ominous potency of their imagery when they've staged Al-Fulani's execution. But that camcorder fixed on a stand with open LCD screen has been the setup behind many real 
real-life executions, to the horror of the world trying to comprehend the phenomenon. Low bitrate distorted image of true horror was shocking beyond comprehension, and to be placed into the perspective of the victim was an incredibly bizarre experience. There are a lot of great introductions to a story or a setting or characters, and the coup is right up there with the best ones. It is much better than a traditional cutscene and achieves a lot more, with more style. Blackout introduces the disrupted calm of the Russian countryside. Pink twilight rises above the swamp as you move through enemy outposts. Jeep passes on the bridge overhead as you go through one of its arches. When you are in stealth mode, any human presence deepens the tension of infiltration. The high point of the level is the silent entry into a house where Nikolai is held hostage. As you enter the house, new soundtrack begins, introducing a new mode of combat. Peculiar looking filter of the night vision goggles corrodes the whole interior with an unnatural green, the same color used for the title font, that's how much it characterizes the new aesthetic of the game. This glowing color shows us the fundamental difference between modern warfare and the good old war. Technology is on another level, and it aids the war and combat in ways those Thompsons and Satchel charges never could have. Carefully placed enemies and their scripted fear and shock are like figures in a diorama of death. They are placed for you to play with, to experience a sensation of absolute domination. There is no chance for a fair fight, just cold-blooded professionalism. One calls for his pal Sasha while feeling the wall with his left hand, sidearm ready in his right. The other is sitting scared to death in the corner, aiming his gun across the whole room. One is hiding behind an overturned table and fires randomly. Another peeks behind the door and you shoot him through the wood as you remember your training. The weight of his corpse opens the door. The last one emerges from the corner and when shot drops his flashlight towards the ruffled Nikolai on the floor, casting his defenseless shadow on the wall. Shooting loop here is reduced to a very controlled experience of specific predatory action. Just as you really start to get the feel for this new kind of war, it ends, leaving you wanting more of it. Hunted begins with a sequence that justifies the title of the mission. Helicopter you're in gets taken out with a missile and you become prey while pushing through waves of enemies towards an extraction point. At the end of the level you are presented with a snippet of gunship's devastating effect, profane in its invisible power, then you are given that power. We get to see stylized violence and action throughout the campaign, but only death from above shows us the real horror of the modern war. We were only beginning to comprehend the phenomenon of disconnected killing as a species and I think that the transition has happened too fast for us to truly assimilate the implications of this phenomenon into our existence. This detached carnage is disturbing. The fact that you can obliterate 20 people to pieces and then take a lunch break is a new genre of horror. This whole segment is presented without any moral hand-holding. The game only provides mechanics and circumstantial dialogue. The integration of the experience is up to the player. This mission is another swift cut in the standard FPS gameplay. The whole mission has an underlying eeriness to it. This is one of the most subversive moments in gaming. Modern FPS played on medium difficulty still requires an active participation. Gunship level basically has no difficulty. An average gamer has faced piles of weapons in front of them throughout their gaming catalogs, but here you are put behind a monitor, from which you rain hellfire down on whatever those white dots are. It doesn't pose any traditional FPS challenges to your reflexes. It's the easiest act of killing in the whole campaign. This is the future of war, shooting at dots and extinguishing worlds of hopes and dreams with a press of a button as light as flicking a light switch. The act of killing people has been physically reduced to the effort it takes to go through TV channels. This is one of those unsettling experiences that lack the usual triggers such as gore or intense violence, gamification of the mechanics of war. Low humming of the gunship's engine provides a soundtrack to this sterile carnage mediated by technology. Look how much Call of Duty has changed because our reality has changed. This is where no amount of investigative journalism, news reports or other forms of art can translate the bizarre mundanity of killing from a gunship. We were splitting each other's skulls just a couple of centuries ago. There's a famous order from the Battle of the Bunker Hill attributed to various officers. Don't fire until you see the whites of their eyes. What a 
strong contrast between the two types of warfare. The true extent to which this experience is disturbing can only be replicated through video games. Comparing this experience with the maturely portrayed battlefields of World at War, it becomes obvious that both are horrific depictions of war. One is viscerally brutal while the other is outright disturbing. It feels a lot like a rudimentary god simulator, but the most frightening thing is that it doesn't simulate god's perspective, but that of a human. These white dots aren't even close enough to be dehumanized or objectified. It is a surreal experience of existential horror, on the very edge of the spectrum of violence, opposite from the intimacy of torture. What for me pushes the whole sequence over the edge of uncanny is the workplace humor. Operators joke and congratulate each other after a confirmed kill. They are completely desensitized to the physical consequences of their actions on the ground. Those who have seen the real-life footage of the airstrikes released by Wikileaks, with civilian casualties and all too familiar workplace humor know how disturbingly close modern warfare has approached the reality with this level. Light them all up. Come on, fire! Hey, Roger. Charlie Don't Surf is another testament of the insistence on thrilling action and compelling visuals. You get inside the boots of a marine sergeant at the very beginning of an invasion. Silhouettes of Black Hawk helicopters cut through the sky. Another announcement of the new aesthetic identity. The presence of metal in the air. An image turned into an archetype during the Vietnam War and the artistic depictions that followed. Machines juxtaposed against geometric patterns built by minds that perceive beauty in different shapes. Oil rigs in the back background, palm trees on the shore, Arabic writing, they can call it whatever they want but you know where you are. This is Iraq, the ancient land that hosted some of humanity's greatest empires. Once again you have that buildup of anticipation, large scale movement of machines and bodies in the background promises a payoff. Soundtrack is straight from Hollywood flicks and it only stimulates the anticipation of action. Score evolves into an ominous hum once your feet touch the ground and the buildup of expectation keeps rising until it dissolves into a cacophony of firefight. It is really carefully tailored for the visual experience before you. You're made to feel a part of something big that's to come, something looming in broad daylight. The bog and war pig help create a sense of large-scale war. They are grunt experiences made in the image of the original Call of Duty games. You fight your way through the enemy lines, you call in for support, you escort a tank through the streets. The bog reduces the motivation of the mission to something as simple as defending a tank stuck in the mud. Both levels show you the devastating effect this war is having on the city's infrastructure as you move through the gutted buildings and deserted bazaars. There's no privacy in war, and you clear an apartment complex room by room, witnessing the destructive invasion of the personal space of its past inhabitants. At the end of War Pig, there's a tense scripted event where you're facing the barrel of T-72 without any means to take it out, while friendly tank is behind a barrier. But its timely shot is navigated by radio and Warpig takes the tank out through walls of an apartment building. A firework of sparks bursts out of its seams before the turret flies off. Soldier besides you celebrates as if this was a football match. Shock and Awe is an action-packed thrill of a mission. Briefing makes you believe that this is it. You are tightening your circle of metal and flesh around Al-Assad. Once again you are in a position of power as you obliterate everything below you from behind a semi-automatic grenade launcher. There is so much action going on in the foreground with helicopters and tanks moving in and this only reinforces your position of dominance as a part of a large-scale movement with singular purpose. But the mission plays with your emotions. Out of this destructive conformity you are placed under heavy fire and a time constraint in order to rescue a wounded Captain Pulayo as she has her poetic cowboy last stand with an mp5 and as you carry her inside a helicopter this sudden and unexpected danger develops into a feeling of success as you take off new information comes through radio but it's cut off by a nuclear blast manifested before you is one of the greatest of humanity's fears impersonal annihilation of life on an unprecedented scale unlike bubonic plague or earthquakes this one cannot be counted as one of god's punishments this one's on us somebody had to press the button that somber slow burning music during the briefing is now revealed to be a foreshadowing of this horror. In hindsight you realize how unfit that soundtrack was for the mission that was to end the invasion and had such a stark contrast compared to the Charlie Don't Surf intro, but this was unpredictable from player's standpoint.
Aftermath is an interactive exhibition of props with shock value and subversion of traditional protagonists' immortality. Everything Marines did was futile, because Al-Assad wasn't even there, but out of this mushroom cloud emerged two sequels. This is the act that will push the whole world over the edge. In a course of a few hours you go from cinematic invasion to death in a nuclear blast. It is a complete deconstruction of what an FPS can be. First you are behind a grenade launcher and then you are without a gun. Just a camera moving forward in order to witness the extent of horror inflicted upon the space. And just like the coup, this level serves as a testament to the power of interactivity, even when it's minimal. Cutscene would have taken so much life and impact from the event. Actually getting up, stepping out on the street, turning around and looking from the same perspective you were shooting a minute ago is such a bizarre experience. A level you can't win in a campaign where you barely win. Safe House and Heat are basically a single in and out mission, split by the intermission of Young Price's excursion in Pripyat. In Safe House you become the king of the hill for a couple of minutes, enough for Price to turn the whole concept of a bad guy on its head by taking Al-Assad nonchalantly and doing what an army of US soldiers died trying to do across multiple missions. In Heat you run down a hill through waves of enemies. Mechanically nothing new has happened, aesthetically it's still the same game, but the real bad guy is revealed. Mastermind from the Shadow and he must be so bad that Al-Assad and everything he might know became irrelevant and worthless by the end of his sentence. Price discards the cell phone, draws his pistol and shoots Al-Assad in the head without hesitation. You leave behind a corpse of a militant leader tied to a chair. In one particularly brutal moment, Price punches him in the loin and the guy jumps to the side together with the chair. I love that they didn't even discard his menacing red beret. Now crumpled and misshapen, it rests high on his scope as a reminder of lost power. Screen fades from black and your senses are violated with a panorama of a wasteland. A real-life wasteland. What I like the most about this opening is the fact that you hear Macmillan before seeing him. His movement mid-sentence concentrates all your attention in that spot as you make a connection between camouflage on your avatar's gun and a talking bush. You are literally revealed the essence of the level. After you get tricked yourself, it's easy to maintain the illusion throughout the rest of the mission. You are in the hauntingly beautiful outskirts of the irradiated pre Yet. Radiation bleached green dominates the screen during the course of the whole mission. Everything is decaying towards a kingdom of cockroaches. Besides nature taking over concrete, the other most significant visual element that marks this whole experience is the coexistence of the traditional orthodox architecture with the Soviet one. An ancient religion and state atheism clashing together through architecture, both visually distinctive and representative of the ideologies that fed the hands that brought them up from the dirt, ripped them out of the clothes of shapeless non existent distance into monuments of an idea. Few things are as strong of a symbol of no future than the image of an abandoned playground. This town is a monument to humanity's transience. Whole apartment buildings empty of life. Packs of wild dogs claiming the streets as their own. Empty public pools and fairgrounds. There's a graveyard of tanks being turned into a mass grave. Especially morbid experiences when you go through an empty school cantina. The motif of an abandoned city, a place where 50,000 people used to live, is perhaps an unintentional subtext in a game that evokes the paranoia of the Cold War. A modern ruin, not too different from the remains of ancient civilizations. The whole city is under the oppressive shadow of the absence of life. All Gilead Up remains one of the most memorable time travel trips I've ever had. Details such as a small flag on a car indicating wind direction and distinctly visible Coriolis effect add some flavor to immersion. Movement of the avatar isn't animated any differently than in previous missions with far more hectic combat. But the way Captain Macmillan moves basically maintains the whole illusion for me. His movement is what sells the whole experience. If it was a solo mission you wouldn't get stealth vibes this strong, since your avatar gives little feedback of stealth. He's the one that sets the pace. There's certain elegance and measure to his movement and gestures. This is the highest aesthetic point of the level. The most visually pleasing thing about this mission is the way Macmillan moves. Opening doors, walking leaning against cover, signaling with his hands. Everything is designed in such a way to reinforce the sensation of a covert operation. In Modern Warfare 2 they tried to replicate this experience with Captain Price, changing bleached out Pripyat for the snowy woods and giving Price a wide array of beautifully animated stealth movement and gestures, but to a much weaker effect. Neither did it work with Soap nor Reznov. Compared to the movement of your scouts from Ghost Warrior, Medal of Honor and Battlefield 3, animations in Old Gilead Up are far more nuanced in their expression. 
Mission strikes the balance between tension and release while you methodically go from situation to situation and your emotional response follows these oscillations. It capitalizes on the sensation of observing potential threat while being hidden from it. Mechanically, this is just a matter of determining the field of view for NPCs, but psychologically it creates an instinctive and intense response from the player. Paul Gillida is a proof of how much can be achieved in terms of experience without adding exosuits and wall running to the equation. One shot, one kill quickly returns to a more familiar FPS experience after the assassination attempt, but Old Gillida still lingers in your mind long after the game returns to its familiar course. This mission is where the first-person references for a stealth sniping mission have been established and entombed for years to come. A lot of similar missions from popular FPS series came out of Macmillan's ghillie suit. The Sins of the Father is a heavily scripted experience that feels a lot like playing through a film. Out of the anticipation of carefully orchestrated ambush, you are thrown into the breakneck chase. The pacing suddenly changes just when you thought you have the upper hand. All of it for the efforts to be futile once again. A recurring theme of the Modern Warfare series. That moment when you corner Zakaev Jr. on hotel rooftop feels like a well-deserved victory and Victor's fanaticism in refusing to be taken alive is shocking in its resolve and Lack of hesitation. The sight of his body in a pool of blood feels surreal. This was a new dramatic standard in single-player campaigns. Just when you thought they didn't have any more surprises to pull off, they have a character kill himself in front of you. Third act is a single narrative response split up into more manageable levels of action for the sake of fluidity and pacing. Ultimatum of the act 3 is where both mechanics and aesthetics start to rewind, repeating things we already saw in the first two chapters, and the excitement of running around the globe fighting an invisible war starts to wear off a bit. This is where the narrative wrap-up takes the spot and keeps the tension until the finale. As they close in on Zakaev's nuclear facility, you see that staggering image of warheads being launched towards American cities in an act of revenge, but the game has pulled off enough shockers by that time that you can't really be sure what will happen with those warheads, and this keeps the tension real until the very end. Gaz and Griggs joke about who's going to pay for drinks after the mission and share their culture's variation in the proper way to savor a glass of beer. In hindsight, this leaves a bitter taste in your mouth once you know their fate. Level begins in the middle of a high-octane chase. It's a mad high point of action with choreographed destruction in slow motion. Motion that was stimulated throughout the whole campaign with its pauses and heights is now brought down to a halt, to a single slow motion trigger pull. The ending is no less cinematic and intense than the beginning and serves just to the whole narrative as it brings many storylines to an end with just enough of loose ends for a sequel. And for the first time you can't just glance over the bodies lying on the ground like you're doing combat. Here there's too many faces you'd recognize. Stealth of Night on a freighter in Crew Expendable is contrasted with an epilogue in the middle of the day, way up in the sky. A 60 seconds of enjoyably repeatable rush throughout a hostage situation in the clouds. Mile High Club is like a cherry on top of whipped cream, just plain showing off level you have to rush through by design. Such a tight package of visual identity, a summary of what the game is aesthetically about. One final countdown of all those elements that made the experience unique and enjoyable. Tactics, new uniforms and gear, iconic firearms, interesting set pieces, rush, tension, cinematic action, slow motion, the beauty of movement in its barest form. There is a long history behind those two hands and a gun. Modern Shooter was already being shaped both mechanically and aesthetically with Vegas, but the experience was defined with Modern Warfare in terms of pacing, style of execution and balance within elements. Vegas already had much of the modern FPS DNA and had taken more risks than it is credited for. No cutscenes, story told exclusively through camera feeds on the helmet, third-person cover system, suppressor and fire selector, tactical resolutions to hostage situations, rudimentary management of a two-man team, dark ambient scores and the new level design of modern setting. All of these combined brought a unique tactical feel to the gameplay. But still, pacing and the way story was presented belonged to the world of the old video games. Its loading screen almost feels like clinical death of a video game design. It lacks momentum. The experience is presented to you in distinctive beats, while Modern Warfare is a streamlined experience of rush, tension and release. Technically speaking, in both games you shoot your way through corridors and arenas until you check off a set of objectives. But Vegas was 
paced like the old games with that sharp cut between the missions. Here we get a distinction between tactical mechanics and tactical aesthetics, which makes Modern Warfare seem like a game that has killed the tactical shooter and gave rise to the new kind of FPS, focused on cinematics and thrilling action instead of methodology. If you want a more mechanically tactical experience, you should look to SWAT 4 and Arma. If you want a grittier grunt experience of war, you should try World at War or Red Orchestra. If you want the middle ground, you play Modern Warfare. Medal of Honor 2010 was essentially the same aesthetic reboot of the series, mixing special forces with the regular army. It had featured multiple avatars, helicopter missions, stealth segments, rescue mission and some high caliber sniping. That whole new FPS package established and defined by modern warfare. It had badass characters, flow of the modern warfare dictated by the new technologies. It had tense moments from both intense action and suspensive stealth, but it had never reached neither cinematic heights of the modern warfare nor the momentum of its its pacing and the thrill of its flow. The big difference was that the conflict here is actual representation of the war in Afghanistan. This had brought some thematic complexity not reflected through either mechanics or aesthetics. But the most inferior thing compared to modern warfare was the pacing. Medal of Honor had kept the pacing of the classical FPS. It sacrificed continuity of action for unnecessary pre-rendered videos that don't improve on the story in any way. It had committed the greatest sin of video games, breaking gameplay with not even brilliant cutscenes and sacrificing interactivity. There is a long line of playable but average FPS campaigns behind Modern Warfare and a longer one of those lost to history. Looking back through history down the other side of the barrel of the gun, it becomes clear that Modern Warfare didn't invent neither mechanics nor aesthetics of the modern shooter. Instead it had packaged them together in a way that ended up defining Modern Warfare experience in video games for years to come. So many interesting narratives and aesthetics were wasted on these outdated designs. Look at Necrovision or You Are Empty for example. Example. Perhaps two of the saddest examples of this are Airborne and Payback. They feel like dinosaurs, despite being released the same year as Modern Warfare. Their narrative and its pacing feel like something from early 2000s. The fact that Modern Warfare stood out so much for so many people is a testament to the idea that more than just visuals and the shooting loop, the integration of all these elements into an experience is what holds the most value. And it took a lot of hands holding guns and pulling triggers to arrive at this moment. Remaster is like an after image of the original experience, a somewhat bizarre adventure altogether. Visuals and audio are significantly improved, but the skeleton and animations of the game are the same, and my mind got stuck in a sort of a limbo of whether this experience is the same or merely familiar, and to what degree these two are separate experiences. This is not a director's cut, nor a remake, or a reboot. The original is part of history, that's something that cannot be taken away, but the game will eventually age, and graphics will become a barrier to experiencing gameplay for many, so there's a possibility that 20 years from now players will overlook the subtitle remastered and consider the game to be the definitive experience, not even bothering to boot up the original once it becomes the equivalent of today's, let's say, Metal Slug, even though I still play Metal Slug from time to time mostly because of how aesthetic I find it to be. But no matter how technically superior the remaster may be, I find the original to be the definitive experience and in this case both a starting and return turning point of the Modern Warfare series. Remaster is just a bonus, an eye candy. Its technical redecoration emerges from a solid foundation and, essentially, it tries to capture the same tension, excitement and emotional heights with improved graphics, but it's not a classic. When a punk band covers a sea shanty, I treat both as separate works and I experience them as such, regardless of the similarity in melody and lyrics. Punk aspect gives it a new aesthetic. And I didn't get this with the remaster. Graphics and aesthetics are not the same thing, and when comparing certain levels such as All Gillied Up, I find that I actually prefer the original. It has this distinctive look, the patina of a vintage watch, while remaster looks like any AAA modern publication. I treat it more as an homage than an actual creative effort. It is my belief that technology behind work becomes part of its aesthetic, so there's no need to change it every time there are advances. However, all this being said, Remaster softens my heart with certain changes. Just take a look at the facelift the cool level has received for example. Environments are more detailed. Alfalani voices his protest before being struck with the butt of the rifle. In the original he was silent. There's some hot coffee floating around in a cup as the car moves. Victor throws his cell phone on the dashboard after the call. This civilian is almost hit by a car. This one gets executed while trying to escape. This execution looks far more brutal. Look at how this SAS operative steps over the doorstep and checks his corners. These details help elevate the craft to a whole other level. 
This is a well-established trend by now. A war happens and art follows. Two forms of human expression. The evolution of our understanding of the phenomenon progresses through our ability to imitate the experience, reimagine it, relive it in a safer space. This artificial mirroring of reality for the sake of safe contemplation is a safe space for exploring spectrums of human condition. By the time it was released, there were different paradigms of thinking about modern wars and examining the experience. Black Hawk Down highlighted the heroism and sacrifice through intense and cinematic action. Jarhead depicted the absurdism behind the structure of the war machine and its eventual toll on the human mind. Redacted explored the dark crevices of the human nature inherent to every conflict. Modern warfare follows the formula of Black Hawk Down the most, insisting on powerful imagery and offering a more sensational portrayal of war. What Black Hawk Down essentially did was took the old war hero story and its mythology and translated it into a modern cinematic language of big budget productions. Despite visually strong setting, modern warfare has less culture than the desolate wasteland of rage, where things crawling out of the ground at least have a backstory to their tribalism. There's no psychology behind soldiers, no culture behind enemies. Its historicity is reduced to visuals. It is both unhistorical and ahistoric. And this has probably helped the game a lot, minimizing the inherent controversy of its subject matter. It was more fitting for the format anyway. Between simple shooting mechanics throughout linear levels and minimalistic briefings, there was barely any room for story, let alone proper examination or criticism of anything. Medal of Honor reboot didn't really benefit in any way for trying to portray a real war and simplifying its messy politics in the process. Straightforward shooters are perhaps yet to find a way to deal with as complex subjects as politics through interactivity. RPGs do it better, but it had brought us closer to those streets echoing automatic fire than films or news reports ever did, and gave us that thing that's almost scarier than the war itself, interactivity. We are still living in the aesthetic legacy of the original Modern Warfare. Its campaign imposed itself as a standard measure to other shooters. Many of the missions that came in years after its release echoed the atmosphere and sensation of Blackout, Hunted, The Bog and Old Gillied Up. Out of its legacy emerged not just Modern Warfare subseries, but the general framework for Advanced Warfare and Ghosts as well. But with them, momentum was also lost as the story began to expand. It's hard to pull off something like this twice. Modern Warfare 2 and 3 had upped the action sequences and melodrama, relying heavily on both subversions and controversy, but they are forever destined to be sequels to a masterpiece. Its success had single-handedly reduced the variability amongst the first-person shooter campaigns. Different concepts such as SWAT 4 didn't survive. Far Cry's open world and Call of Duty's linearity entered a stage of domination on the market. There was post Half-Life and now there's post Modern Warfare. Modern Warfare is a neo-classic first-person shooter, more than worthy to brush shoulders in top 10 lists with Doom, Medal of Honor and Half-Life. Not because it had invented something new, but because it had utilized old mechanics to create a new experience. Famous British painter Elizabeth Thompson had produced a lot of military-themed paintings, one of the most striking ones being the remnants of an army. Depicting an army surgeon arriving at the gates of Jalalabad after the event known as the Massacre of Elphinstone's army. Lone figure riding on an exhausted horse, unwelcoming mountains of Afghanistan in the distance, the graveyard of empires. In her autobiography she wrote, I never painted for the glory of war, but to portray its pathos and heroism, which is what Modern Warfare did, preserving the legacy of the series. It doesn't show the absurdity or tragedy of war, it just appropriates its vicious beauty and strives to replicate its thrilling action. It takes a place between Medal of Honor's oversimplification of war and the cynicism of Far Cry 2. Some people like their shooters straightforward, fast-paced and bloody. Others like emotional stories amongst the gory bits and pieces. Some prefer realism, others fiction. Modern Warfare is a beautiful balancing point between the two. Gabriel, 1930-1930, Kevin, Aïda, Sacha.